So this paper draws on a, a, <laughs> a much longer chapter in a forthcoming book called The Wake of Crows Living and Dying in Shared Worlds. So the short version of the paper offers a reflection on hope as a productive concept for thinking about the shifting and diverse relationships between people, animals and environments in the context of ongoing processes of colonisation and extinction. Through this lens of hope, it explores conflicting and entangled futurities, emphasising the need for approaches that attend to the relational, the ethical, the multiplicitous, in terms of species, cultures and more. In this regard, I understand it as working towards an expansive, inclusive, multiplicitous notion of justice, perhaps a multi-species justice. So I was drawn into thinking about hope in this way in a particular place on the island of Rota in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the US Commonwealth. I traveled to Rota in 2016 in an effort to learn more about the critically endangered Mariana crow, or aga as it's known in Chamorro. Over the past several decades, the aga has all but disappeared from the face of the earth. Once found living on the island of, islands of Guam and Rota, the aga is today completely extinct on Guam and just clinging to existence on Rota. The aga is a smallish, omnivorous crow. Its diet comprised of a wide range of plants and animals, including insects, smaller reptiles and bird's eggs. They're forest birds, relatively shy in nature. They tend to keep within or below the jungle canopy rather than soaring above. The cause of the aga's disappearance on the island of Guam seems to be straightforward. As with so many other birds and animals, predation by the accidentally introduced brown tree snake is thought to have been the primary factor. But the decline of the aga on Rota, the island of Rota, is a bit more of a puzzle. The brown tree snake has not yet established itself on the island. Instead, biologists generally point to a few interwoven factors. Predation, especially by domestic cats, is thought to be central, as is the impact of habitat loss, especially during earlier periods of more expansive development on the island. And it's possible that as an as yet un unidentified disease may also be impacting on the remaining birds. But alongside these factors, it seems that deliberate disturbance and persecution of crows by local people has played a significant role in their decline. According to many Chamorro people that I spoke with on Rota, local people started targeting the birds in the 1990s or early 2000s, shortly after the species was listed under the US Endangered Species Act. As a US Commonwealth, the CNMI, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, is subject to US federal law in various ways, including this act. With its listing and formal protection, the aga began to impact on Chamorro lives and livelihoods in a new way, holding up applications for land clearing and development in areas where the birds might be, as well as, curiously, in some areas that everyone seemed to agree the birds had never been and weren't likely to ever be. Thomas Mendiola, a deeply knowledgeable Chamorro man who lives and farms on Rota and is centrally involved in the preservation of Chamorro language and culture, told me about this situation that pitted the aga against the people. In his words, so there's this dilemma. It's created by the presence of the crow or by me wanting, my wanting to be there, whichever one. The point is, which is it going to be, me or the crow? Now the law that puts one against the other like that is a total confusion. If, there any, if there's any danger to the crow or injustice, I would say it's this law. If I'm a crow, I'm going to tell the federal government, leave me alone. Why do you bring this destruction to me? In recent decades, aga have been shot, they've been harassed and driven off land, they've had their food and nesting trees cut down, ringbarked or poisoned. Put simply, they're now profoundly disliked by many. Stan Tysakin, another Chamorro man, told me about people killing crows and about the ideas and attitudes that motivate this action. He said, the young ones, the children, will hear, about, will hear others being so pissed off, embarrassed that the crow is condemning the land. But it's actually, it's never the crow. It's the human. It's the politics of it. It's crazy. Stan has a keen interest in Aga. Retired now, he spent much of his working life as an employee of the local government conducting biodiversity surveys. He was still upset by the personal price that this work had exacted, by the way in which he'd been viewed by many people as an enemy when conservation projects impacted on their lives, in his view, often unnecessarily. 
Stan argued against the listing of the species as endangered, telling the biologists from the US that the kinds of conservation measures they had in mind would just create tensions. He told me, the crow coexisted happily with people until it became an issue, and then boom, the population went all the way down. Is that how you say you're a conservation biologist? You've got to know the people first. It's not possible to quantify the extent of the impact of this persecution of crows by local people. But without exception, the people that I spoke to said that they knew about people killing aga and or removing their habitat in a targeted manner, and most of them had seen it or taken part in it themselves. During my time in Rota, I was particularly interested in the dreams for the future that the aga was seen to be interrupting. Aga conservation has held up the allocation of Chamorro homestead lands and prevented people from clearing lands to plant crops. In some cases, the bird's presence has very literally brought development projects to a halt. But beyond the immediate and the tangible, the aga has become powerfully freighted with meaning, pervasively linked in the public imagination with all of what is preventing the development of this island, of its economy and of people's standards of living. As one CNMI government employee told me, our development has been held back because of issues like the conservation of the aga. To which his colleague replied, we're living in a primitive age again. In this way, the aga has come to be seen by many as an enemy of the future. This is far too simple a statement. Of course, there are many people on Rota who are imagining futures that include the aga and other endangered species. When I met with the island's mayor, for example, he enthusiastically mentioned to me his vision for an island economy in which ecotourism played a central role. From this perspective, development and conservation might be sustained together. This is yet another potential site for the strange phenomenon that Paige West has described as conservation as development. For the most part, however, it seemed to me that conservation and development on Rota were still more commonly being seen as opposing forces. People's hopes for a better life for them and their families were seen to be threatened, not nurtured by Aga. I don't have a simple solution to this difficult situation. In my telling of this story, I've not done justice to all of the complex histories and ongoing realities of colonization in this US Commonwealth. I haven't even mentioned the looming specter of the US military, which is remaking local lives and landscapes on a disastrous scale in Guam and throughout the CNMI, and both of, that's something that's discussed in a lot more depth in the chapter. Instead of offering a solution, I'd like to turn in the final minutes of this talk to a single hopeful line of thought, a transformation in my thinking that emerged out of my time in Rota. So sitting with Thomas Mendiola one morning in one of the few restaurants on the island, I learned something remarkable about Aga. Thomas was clearly an astute and attentive observer of crows. He said to me, I always enjoy watching the crow. This is a very smart animal as far as I'm concerned. This bird is interesting. I usually get my kids to come and see because the crow's gonna open up these nuts and eat the insides. And the insides, you know, he doesn't eat it there. No, he starts to put it in the hole of a tree, placing it in provision. This is a crow that makes provision. This is not a bird, you know. A bird doesn't make provision. This one does. It puts the nut in there and covers it. Through this offhand remark, Thomas introduced me to a little known behavior of the aga, its propensity to cache the nuts of the Pacific almond tree. As our discussion continued and in subsequent conversations with other people on the island, I learned that this behavior wasn't really little known, it was just selectively known. Although looking through the biological literature on the species, I was unable to find any mention of this caching behavior, although it is very common amongst corvids, Chamorro people seem to be very well aware of it. Biologists I spoke to had also frequently heard about this behavior from local people, but none of them had seen it themselves. It seems, however, that there may be a very good reason for this. Not only are there very few crows left to observe, the Pacific almond is itself a rare tree. It's probably always been quite rare, but in recent years, it's one of the trees that local people have taken to removing to keep agar away from their land. Exploring this caching behavior led me to behavioral biology laboratories in Cambridge and Vienna, where some of the best research on prospective cognition is taking place. Through, conservations, through con conversations with biologists, I learned that when they cache away nuts and other foods, crows do so with a sense of the future. And these, of course, are not Mariana crows in these facilities. They are a, a bunch of different corvids, including some jays who are relatives. Um, 
close relatives uh, of the crows. So th this is uh, in no way an automatic or purely instinctual behaviour. These birds understand, imagine and work towards particular futures. If, for example, they see another bird watching them when they hide away a tasty nut, they're likely to return later to move it somewhere else. And again, this is a much longer part of the, of the chapter um, and it's a fascinating behaviour that I don't have time to go into in any detail today. It seems then that on Rota, the people are not the only ones with something like their own hopes for the future. We inhabit a world of multiplying futures, a world thick with both possibilities and with crafty, desirous living beings working towards their fruition. They're fascinating experiments that show um, where birds are given an opportunity to cache particular kinds of food uh, and then to recover them later. And the, the experiments are basically determining whether or not the birds are able to act uh, based on anticipated future motivational states, uh, whether they uh, cache the kinds of things they want to recover right now or whether they cache the kinds of things that they know they're going to want to recover when they have access to the caches in the future. Uh, and a lot of the birds tend to do the latter. And so this is uh, about exploring the way in which they're able to plan for the future and um, uh, we're not sort of trapped in their present motivational states, if you like. So there's, uh, corvids are amongst those animals that seem to have a capacity to imagine and work towards particular futures. Okay, so I was struck um, by Thomas's use of provisioning to describe this behaviour. The Oxford English Dictionary tells us that provision involves foresight, prevision, looking ahead, especially foresight carefully exercised, prudence or care. So to make provision is to act on previsioning, to make room and take care of and for what might come. This is an incredibly apt term. If Aga are engaged in acts of hope when they cash away their almonds, then these are not simply acts of naive optimism or wishful thinking, Rather, they are concrete acts of placing, of covering, of monitoring, and perhaps relocating. They are active labours of care for the future. In this way, Thomas, via the crows, taught me to reimagine what care might be. There's a tendency in much of the Western philosophical canon, but more broadly than this too, to view hope as an internal feeling, an optimistic psychological state, taken up by a subject in relation to an external world. From this perspective, hope might be understood as a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. In this way, hope is often understood to be part of an immaterial space, somehow distinct from material, material reality, from the way the world actually is. In contrast, Thomas and others on Rota and Guam taught me that hope is a part of the material order of things. Hope is an integral part of the way in which worlds come into being and pass away of the enactment of what is. In this context, hopes are profoundly relational, perhaps even ecological possibilities. They arise out of and are only possible within webs of enabling relationship. In other words, we do not and cannot hope alone. As such, we must cultivate modes of attentiveness to others' hopes, to the futures they imagine and desire and the broader relationships that nurture these lives and possibilities. On Rota, the decline of the Aga has taken form in and through the dissolution of many relationships, including those between these birds and their almond trees, between Aga and a people that long lived alongside them, and between these people and a distant government locked into a conservation practice that doesn't always fit local dynamics and needs as well as it might. As these relationships have deteriorated, the Aga has declined and hopes for its future have become harder to sustain. In the face of a complex history and genuine ongoing adversity and uncertainty, some locals, both Chamorro and conservationists from the US, are working to re-establish key relationships, to cultivate ecologies of hope. The current group of biologists on the ground are doing important work to bolster links with the local community, from the establishment of a small NGO with a strong focus on public participation ed and education, to their active work to enlist local interns to be part of their projects. Meanwhile, the two Chamorro men working for the local government who I referenced earlier expressed a willingness to start planting Pacific almonds and other trees that might increase the Aga population. But any kind of widespread planting program or broad social acceptance of the Aga, as they quickly pointed out to me, is going to require both funding and changes to existing land use regulations. 
There are many difficulties and uncertainties here, both for local people and for the crows. I don't have any concrete solutions to offer in this short reflection. Rather, I've aimed here to at least gesture towards the ways in which diverse visions for the future are caught up with, enabled and disabled by one another. Of course, we also inhabit thick pasts and presents, unequal histories and ongoing realities of violence and loss, which I've only touched on in this short paper today. But alongside careful attention to inheritances, I learnt on Rota that the crafting of hopeful futures always also relies on ongoing, dedicated, careful acts of provisioning. Thank you.